I'd like to call the December 8th, 2020. Actually, hold on a second. Do that. Start the recording. I'd like to call the December 8th, 2020 regular governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Uh, the recording is started. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Chuck. Um, I can keep this within the, the existing comms committee line item, but I am going to make another plea uh, about uh, people joining the communications committee. Right. And that was actually, that was something I was supposed to have added. Um, so yeah, let's do that within the comms communications committee because we were going to add, um, who is it that uh, we wanted to add RD to the communications committee. So I will make sure that I make a note of that. If there's anybody else then that decides that they want to join RD, how many folks do you have on there right now? Do you know? Five. Okay. Yeah. So it'd be nice to have another another couple. So question: um, Do for to be on the committee, do people need to be board members, or can non-board members be on committees? Non-board members can be on committees. Okay. Did you ever reach out to that person in Plainfield that I pointed your way, Chuck? Uh, we chatted. We had a couple of back and forth, but uh, it didn't okay. end up going anywhere at the time. But I can I can reengage gotcha. that person if uh, if coming out of this meeting we feel like we still need some more help. I mean, it's, it's it's up to you. I mean, I might have a little bit more time to help with the communications committee going forward, but I haven't lately. And I do know that this person is 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 good at writing, so. If they're interested, that might be an option. Pre appreciate your you reminding me of that, uh, as I had definitely forgotten about that person. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, so, let's, so let let's circle around back to that when we have that agenda item. Is there anything else that folks want to add to the to the agenda, Alan? Uh, Jeremy, are we going to be talking at all about the announcement, the public announcement to its members by WEC? about their project to build out fiber. And the second thing I wondered about, is there gonna be any discussion about the maps and other comments we got about RDOF? So let's let's have a discussion item about um, WEC and RDOF insofar that we can talk about some of those. I'll put those, um, I'll put those before our executive session. So let's see, add, um, WEC and RDOF, the at least the publicly discussable bits. Yeah, the annual um, or the monthly report that WEC put out, I thought that was that was amazing, and I've been I've been sharing that pretty widely. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll do that. That's because uh, okay, okay, yeah, thank for, you. For for those of you that didn't know, RDOF re released the the winners today. Um, we, there's still things that we can't really talk about, um, but you could, there, the public information is at least out there about who got what block. Or which consortium got what block? My, Michael, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I sent to all the board members um, re RDOF results in a file about five minutes ago. Oh. Only those that we can share and, okay. and in, in preparation for the discussion. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Uh, anything else that we should add to add to the agenda? <laughs> okay. So moving along, um, public comment, are there, is there anything folks want to talk about uh, that is not on the agenda? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, I do want to mention that, uh, and, just, oh, yeah, go ahead, Henry. Um, just a question on uh, rural business development uh, letter of intent, um, which is due the 11th. And are we going to, even if we don't, um, you know, apply for the grant, at least having the letter of intent as a backup. Yeah, I, I personally was expecting to talk about that in the grant funding update. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I mean so 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 my my gut in, my gut instinct is that we we are going to at least put the letter of intent there just so we can sort of put the bookmark in the book, put our foot in the door, what metaphor you like, uh, so that we can eventually, should we choose to do that, that we can we can go that route. Thanks. Cool. Um, one one thing I want to um, that I want to mention, uh, Evan Carlson from the Northeast Kingdom, his uh, his organization Do North, which is a co-working space, they are applying for some funding from the Vermont Community Foundation to do a um, 
CUD accelerator, essentially to take all of the, to essentially provide a, uh, a training for all, well, for a, a limited number of uh, CUD members from each CUD. And the idea is to get everybody onto the same page in terms of being able to talk about the technology and the funding. So like, so I had a conversation with RD um, um, last week, earlier this week, I don't remember exactly when it was, but you know, he had questions and new board members oftentimes have questions about these things. Um, the nice thing about EC fiber and CV fiber is that we, you know, we have a bit of institutional knowledge, even though we've not actually strung fiber yet. But this was a, this was a way that, um, you know, that we would have the ability to take some folks to go and get trained up, and that other folks around the state could also get trained up. So he's envisioning and actually is pretty far along in um, scoping out a um, eight or nine week, um, essentially one reasonably short meeting every every day of the week so every weekday for basically a full two months uh, covering everything from financing to technology to um, working with electric utilities legislative process essentially just to get everybody ramped up um, so if if you are interested in that please shoot me a message and we can see if we can uh, distill that down but should he get funding he's going to start he looks he's looking to start that in january ken What's the source of the expertise? He's tapping uh, a bunch of people from all over the place, including, so uh, Michael, he's been in contact with you. He's talked to um, Stan down at EC Fiber. He's uh, gonna be talking to folks at Eustis. He's essentially just drawing people from all over the place um, to cover mm -hmm. each and of these of topics. The oh out yes, yes. Is. So out of state ISPs, people who've done similar projects, essentially just to give everybody a really good breadth of the stuff that you got to know when you're looking at some of the decisions that we make as a CUD. I mean, so we, we as a board, we kind of learned this stuff in fits and starts. And as people said, hey, uh, what what the heck is is this thing? And then we went and found out, kind of stumbled through it on our own. This is a way that we'd get, you know, folks in, you know, the Southern Vermont CUD or whatever, getting everybody on there, you know, r rather quickly up to speed. So if you are interested in that, please send me an email directly. Um, if we get lots and lots of takers, um, um, we'll have to figure out, and we'll have to ask Evan how he wants to <clears throat> limit how many people are doing that. But I, ex I expect that there's gonna be a lot of interest. My main suggestion to him, um, it was a wide ranging discussion, but my main suggestion to him was for us to, um, for us, for him, as part of the project, find a way to distill the content of those meetings so that we could have the, and I don't remember who mentioned who mentioned this term, but it was what, um, eternal September, what was that? Somebody mentioned that before. I, I don't remember who it was, but the, the idea is that we because we're gonna have so much turnover forever, we're always gonna have some folks who want to know um, what's going on and how to get how to get ramped up, you know, to be able to have a package and say, here is your eight hour CUD in a box seminar, go. And then any sort of detailed questions you can find the answers for. So um, yeah, that will be hopefully forthcoming. Oh, my impression was it was one day a week, not five days a week, but maybe it's evolved. Oh, so so maybe maybe it is one one day a week, and maybe I just just miss misheard, um, misheard what he said. That that would be quite a big commitment for people to take on. Yeah, yeah I, and, and as I was thinking about it, I was I was like, that's a that's an incredible amount of content. That's a uh, that's a that's a full college course there. Yep. So okay. <laughs> All right. Any other uh, public comment stuff that's not not on the agenda? Okay. So uh, uh, excuse me. I'll just add that I just joined you. Um, I am, my name is Phil Chikini. I'm from uh, Barry Town. I've asked the select board to um, nominate me as an alternate, uh, which I, I just joined now because that's where I was uh, on another call and. Uh, um, their meeting it doesn't start until six thirty, so I won't know until after that. But I thought this would be a fun way to spend an evening. All right, welcome, Thank Phil. Thanks for thanks for joining us. We're always very happy to have more more folks join. 
Um, Josh has been shouldering that burden for for quite some time, so I'm happy to uh, happy to know he's he'll have somebody in Barry Town to uh, to help with that. Um, and, and then and you're, if, all, you're going to be appointed as the alternate, correct? I just want to double check. I, I'm Jeremy. I'm the clerk, taking notes. So, uh, well, I I've put my name in, and I, okay, there wasn't a lot of competition. Okay, I understand. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> wasn't for me either. <laughs> you're a junkie, Phil. <laughs> Maybe we should see what goes on after you're playing. Yeah. <laughs> um, All so right. Jerry, on, on the notes, what was Evan's last name? Carlson, C A R L S O N. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so uh, moving on to the, um, to the consent agenda. Um, we have on the consent agenda the approval of November 24th minutes. We also have more bills than just the COS, the project manager in the last mile. I also included our uh, printing bill and our, um, oh, what was the other one? The um, logo work. So you would, you got all of those invoices. I sent those uh, today at about 2 p.m. Um, and I will move that we approve the consent agenda as presented okay. with the addition of Catamount Color and uh, Expand Creative. Second. Okay. I heard Chuck first, sorry. Oh, I... <laughs> All right. So, 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 so Phil, this is, this is a running thing where, where there's this race for some reason for folks to get this, the, uh, the second. So just uh, wanna let you know that we keep it reasonably light. Um, okay, so moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Do I have opposed abstentions or any folks wanting a roll call vote? All right, we have unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Moving on to the finance report. Um, I also sent you the VSCCU bank transactions. Uh, we've not had much going out. Uh, looks like you can see the last round of checks that I sent out. Um, you'll see checks 529, 530, 531. Um, those, that was all the November bills that we, that we approved. I'll be cutting the, the checks for the ones that you approved tonight. I'll be cutting those tomorrow. Um, yeah, nothing too terribly surprising there. Um, uh, I, I did get your, um, I did get your message, Tim, about invoicing the state and making sure that those go to the state. I will do that, um, as I'm cutting them tomorrow. I'll try to do those, do those all at once so that we get reimbursed correctly. Um, any questions or any other, um, anything else about finances that, uh, any, anybody has? Okay. Good news. Let's move on then. Uh, communications committee talking about hosting services, web design services, and appointment of new members. So Chuck, I'll let you drive on this one. Great. Um, so before we get to a couple of motions that we need to make, let me provide the board with a little bit of backstory and context. So uh, last month we put out an RFP looking for a website developer to revamp the CV Fiber website. Um, to that RFP, we received four proposals. Uh, some proposals had, uh, you know, kind of big agency polish and, and a lot of detail and, and uh, some were a little bit lighter on detail and, and you know, were, were clearly smaller agencies. The reality though, is that only one proposal actually committed to standing something up by the deadline uh, upon which we need something stood up. So we spent a lot of time in the communications committee talking about the merits of all of the different proposals and, and giving them all a fair shake. Um, there were a couple we ruled out for miscellaneous reasons. Um, one of the reasons included uh, technology selection for the hosting of the website, uh, selecting a fairly obscure uh, platform or or trying to push a proprietary platform. Um, and we ultimately selected two finalists, even though only one of them even committed to uh, completing the project in time. And we interviewed both of them. Um, and uh, the interviews went pretty well. Uh, both did seem like great candidates. However, the reality was one of them could not even start the work until after the new year. The great news is uh, the candidate who did commit to doing um, the website by the end of the year, uh, we had an absolutely wonderful interview with. Um, 
Uh, she's uh, she's kind of an independent agency, uh, one 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 person shop, uh, and uh, she seems very approachable, very easy to work with. Uh, has has decent design chops, um, and uh, sounds like will be a really great fit for for bringing our website to the next evolution. Um, in addition to that, she just recently helped DV Fiber, Deer 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 View Valley, Deerfield Deer Valley. Um, yep. CUD uh, in, in Southern Vermont launch their website. Um, and so what, what our conversation with her has largely been is that for this next phase, we acknowledge we only have three weeks to get this done. So could we get pretty much to that, that level of sophistication? We're obviously not going to be to say East Fibers level of sophistication with interactive uh, maps and routes and and stuff like that published yet at this point in time, or the ability to sign up and register and, and check service levels at your address, but at least to get something out there that, that has more polish, provides quite a bit more information than we have today, um, and uh, also presents our, our brand in, in, in a better way. Um, and she felt very comfortable that she was going to be able to do that. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the, 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 the back story. Uh, any questions before we get to the motion coming out of the communications committee? Yes, Chuck, Henry. You wanna, I'm sorry, Chuck, you might want to mention our uh, interview with the, the reference. Oh yeah, Henry, hold that thought. Um, we also did reference check uh, and the reference was the chair of the communications committee at DV, uh, DV Fiber. Um, and uh, not only did he have absolutely wonderful things to say about working with her, um, he specified that he has worked with her in the past and would work with her again in the future, which uh, in my book is, is always a, a great way to, to think about um, somebody's quality. Uh, so Henry, fire away. I'm just curious, um, will she be able to do the interface to the COS system? Is that, um... A little bit of it, uh, but at this point in time, we are actually still waiting for information from, I, I think it's actually supposed to be Coos, is that right, Michael? Coos Systems? Um, I, I yep. think we're still waiting for information on exactly how that technical implementation can proceed. So we're going to have to remain a little bit flexible as to what we can actually get by the end of the year on that based on how complicated it ends up being. We should be able to get at the very least things such as um, email newsletter sign up form. Um, and, and, you know, if we just got that, you know, we have one today, but it doesn't feed automatically into Coos. Uh, so if we if we got to that point, um, I think that would be good. But we will continue to explore the boundaries there and see if we can even get it a little bit further. I guess similarly, um, if if there's any way, uh, would she be able to do the embedding of of um, ArcGIS or any of that? I don't know how easy these APIs are, or you know how technical they are. So. Sure. Um, it, it again depends. Uh, I think we would need to do some research on ArcGIS and, and see exactly what their capabilities are. Now, my understanding is ArcGIS is pretty sophisticated in terms of allowing you to embed content onto other websites. Uh, I don't know, David, if you want to weigh into that a little bit more. I guess my bigger question would be around licensing and, and how we are allowed to use it. Yep. So we may have to work on that, but it's, no, it's easy to do. And, okay. Um, Thanks. Any any other questions? Okay, um, hearing no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and, and proceed to the motion now. I, I did send the language around to the board so you could all get a preview of the language and I'll go ahead and just read that here now into record. Um, um, and thank you, Ray, for drafting it in a, in a really clear and concise way. It's, it, it really is clear what we're asking for here. So, uh, whereas CV Fiber desires a website that provides the public with user-friendly access to information, services, and its governments, governance, and whereas CV Fiber desires a website that is secure, scalable, readily updatable, and supports integration of email and third-party services, and Whereas CV Fiber published an RFP for the design and development of the website on November 19th, 2020 and received multiple proposals in response, it is moved that, one, CV Fiber enter into a contract with CodeWriter 
for the design, development, and technical support of a CD Fiber website in accordance with the contract statement of work, such work to be completed uh, other than the maintenance by 30th of December 2020 and less extended by the parties. Two, CV Fiber enter into such contracts as appropriate for the provision of email hosting maintenance and security services. Three, CV Fiber approves an amount not to exceed um, $7,500 for the foregoing contracts, although we're actually going to amend that to $10,000 and I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so CV Fiber approves an amount not to exceed $10,000 for the foregoing contracts. And four, CV Fiber authorizes the project manager to negotiate and the chair to execute such contracts and for the chair to approve any extensions as deemed appropriate within the authorized funding. So that is the motion. Second. Right. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Seconds. Any further discussion of this? To me, it seems pretty straightforward. Jeremy, I just note that the language is there in the chat room. Um, yep. Chuck didn't read it exactly as on the um, on the um, uh, chat and what's in the chat, uh, specifically number one, for example, um, where it talks about the website to be launched by 30 December. Or, yeah, launched by 30 of December. That's great. Um, so th that that would allow us to have a uh, maintenance portion of the contract that would allow uh, security updates to be applied. And um, if we wanted, you know, new page template down the road, something that we could get uh, out of this developer over the course of the next um, one year. And uh, and that actually explains the difference in the price from the the original motion to the motion that we have here. Um, I won't get into specifics of what we are talking about, but there are, there are a few different meet, moving parts of the cost here. Uh, that is the initial design and development of the website to be launched by the end of the year. Uh, the secondary portion would be a maintenance contract or retainer uh, for future work over the course of the next one year to be uh, done in order to support its ongoing existence. Uh, and then there's some other services such as hosting uh, that we have to pay for uh, separately in order to host said website. Um, any any other questions, comments, discussion points? So this Microsoft versus Google thing that you and I have been talking about by email, is this, um, does that included then in the $10,000? Or is that going to be a separate item? That would, that would be a separate item as it is thought of right now. Um, it is worth noting, just as an aside, uh, I have applied for Microsoft's nonprofit program. Uh, a salesperson I spoke to there said that while their website literature um, does not talk about municipalities and is really focused in 5013C, that they have been known to make exceptions in the past. And so he encouraged us to apply, uh, and I did so today. Great. Yeah, so so we were talking about essentially, you know, looking at, at Google as an option, looking at Microsoft as an option to to have cvfiber.net addresses for uh, potentially for all board members, rather than sort of the the ad hoc, you know, cvfiber.moretown at gmail.com that that Chuck has, um, and I, th I think it that lends quite a bit more credibility to have our own our own domain name, and that and also um, spending the money to have a hosted um, phone number. So if we go with Google and be Google Voice, I don't I don't know what Microsoft calls their um, phone voice over IP product or whatever, but um, it would be something something similar. Just so it so we're not putting you know my cell phone number on all of the, the letterhead and all of the and everything, which which is fine. I don't get that many calls, but or I should say I don't get that many calls where I have to talk to people. Um, so not that many people leave messages, but in addition, both of these services would include uh, cloud based document sharing and collaboration. And I know as an, an open body, we have to be a little bit careful on the collaboration aspect of it. But at the very least, it would give us the sharing and the tools to be able to make edits. And, and um, the the primary difference between the two, of course, being that the Microsoft suite of services comes with uh, the, the desktop or thick clients. Um, whereas the, the Google suite of services is all web-based. Um, the, the Microsoft does have web-based as well. Uh, frankly, they're not quite as good in my humble opinion as the Google services, uh, but you know you can't beat those desktop applications. They're obviously best in class. Is this part of this motion? And if it isn't, can we vote? 
<laughs> so, but so I, I wanted to make clear that we knew what we were voting on, so that nobody's surprised when the next agenda item is about hosting, you know, with Microsoft or with Google. So this does not yeah. cover that then. This this is specifically about the website itself. Uh, we'll keep email separate. It does include the hosting aspect of uh, the website. So the website hosting is included in this package, but email hosting will be separate. Okay. Uh, one one question, uh, with, with, with actual website hosting, and I'm sure I, I may have missed that, and I apologize, what, who would that hosting be with, specifically? Uh, right, right now, we're considering WP Engine. They're a, a host that is specifically designed to host web WordPress websites at scale and take care of a lot of the update and security um, considerations. In addition to that, at our scale, they're incredibly cheap at $300 a year. Uh, for up to, I think it's 25,000 visitors a month. Uh, and then the next tier up up, to, up above that goes to like 1,200 a year. So they're incredibly economical. I've used them to run $40 million business websites in the past um, and you know not had issues with security. Uh, there are some additional security considerations we could put into place on top. Uh, however, at this point in time, I don't think we need to quite go down that path. But for example, we could take uh, Cloudflare's um, uh, uh, distributed denial of service protection layer and put that in front in their DNS hosting uh, for those of you. Uh, I'm happy to define any of these terms if anybody <laughs> wants, um, but but in the interest of time, just trust me that I don't think we need that just yet. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, the only other thing that I would add is that if we are going to start collecting um, customer data, um, and things like that. We've got to be really careful about the GDPR type of, you know, things that, that, that regulations that, that come yeah. into that. Yeah. So, so, but be, be, be and, and Josh, mindful of that going forward. Josh, that's, that's a great point. Josh. And, and the good news here is that uh, our vendor that is going to be handling the customer data and PII, uh, personally identifiable information, is actually Sweden-based. So I'm sure that is top of mind for them. <laughs> so uh, Chuck? Did UVM Medical Center try to hire you? <laughs> they did not. <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't know if uh, I would have touched that one. <laughs> uh, Henry, you had your hand up. Oh, I, I just uh, was in the whereas uh, clauses, there was no mention of the SEO optimization. I assume that's that's part of the scope of work, though. Um, she does include that as part of scope of work. Uh, that said, that happens to be my wheelhouse, so I'm going to take on some of that as well. So um, for, for those of you not familiar, my background is in managing large-scale websites and in particular managing growth uh, and SEO optimization teams at those large-scale websites. So um, SEO is a thing I, I know a thing or two about and, and think I can help with. And, and, and we appreciate your work and uh, appreciate not sending invoices. <laughs> All right. Any anything else on uh, on Chuck's motion here? All right. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Jeremy. Oh, oh, uh, it, I, it's, was it's, that it's, motion it's, to be amended? Sorry. No. I, I didn't jump in here fast enough. So and so uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a point of order, we are we are in the midst of voting. We can get back to that in a second. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Uh, abstentions or folks who want to do this as a roll call. Okay, motion passes unanimously. RD, you had a question. Now that it's now that the motion is oh. passed. Is that motion to be amended? <clears throat> to change no. the sum from 7500 to 10000 or was that all in the text the, no that so so that the 10000 was included in the motion that i pasted into the chat that is that is the motion um oh, I, the one I, I been able, sorry i haven't been able to find chat and go to meet it so so it's it. uh, in the upper right hand corner there's the little picture of people there's 22 people there's a little like dialog bubble click the dialog bubble there it is thank you all right. you're welcome Excellent. All right. All right. Well, um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for making that smooth. Um, I do have uh, one other motion pertaining specifically to this project 
that I want to put forward. Uh, and, and the background, um, actually, we, we may even will just skip a motion. Uh, I guess I can just open it up for discussion because uh, technically I think the authority has already been delegated. But we have an incredibly tight timeline here. We have three weeks to get this done. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of work to be done. And the key here is I don't think we're going to have a ton of room for board oversight to be able to hit our deadline. And so I really just want to make sure everybody is comfortable um, with the communications committee running with this project. And, and if you want to be involved, I would encourage you to come join us uh, as part of the communications committee or at least as part of the project team on this project, if not joining the communications committee uh, um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but I would really love to avoid having to have additional governance board approvals um, going forward on this particular initiative so that we can get it to the finish line. Um, I guess, you know, does anybody have a major strong objection to that idea? And if so, let's talk about it. No, I'm all for, for making it happen. Yeah, well said, Chuck. Great. All right. So, yeah, I, as far as as far as I know, that we we had a motion in a previous uh, in a previous meeting that essentially you know gave the communications committee the uh, responsibility to to go and do this. So I'm happy to operate under that assumption. So um, take the wheel. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, does anyone have? Go ahead, Rick. Were we going to do, do appointments where there are people who are going to raise their hand? Yeah, there's um, there's still still two more things okay. under communications committee before we're done. So okay. the first of all is I, I wanted to talk about these hosting services. Does anybody have any feedback or thoughts about about hosting hosting email and such? Uh, so Chuck and I have been talking about specifically Google and Microsoft. The funding from with the CARES Act funds have to be spent on essentially the, the minimal duration package. Um, and because Google, I believe, has a, it has a monthly package, we would only be able to get funding for a month because that is going to get us to the end of the year. If the minimum size package is a one-year package, you can, we can do that. And uh, it appears that the Microsoft package is, in fact, a annual contract. So, um, so but, Jeremy, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to burst this bubble a little bit. Uh, um, while that is what they advertise on their marketing pages, uh, when you actually go to sign up, they do give you the opportunity for a month by month commitment. Okay, so we may decide to do this anyways and just absorb the price, and you know, using some of the funding that we've received from the Vermont Community Foundation. Um, it seems like a valuable enough thing to do. Um, do you want price. to go into the economics of it really quick? Uh, if, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, well, just a quick order of magnitude, like how much money we're talking about for the next year. So that if we're saying we're going to take, you know, $4,000 out of our $20,000 for the Vermont Community Foundation so that I can know or we can all know how much is left, yep. that, so, I think so, that would be helpful. So if we sum an account for each of the 20 delegates and um, um, and, and maybe just like delegates and alternates share an account uh, or something like that. Plus we have three accounts for say clerk, treasurer and uh, project manager. We are running between 13 to $1,600 a year for the base tiers on both products uh, to about 3,300 a year uh, for the higher tier. If we layer on the additional 20 for uh, uh, primary delegates and alternate delegates to each have their own account and email address, it essentially just doubles at that point in time. So we'd be looking at about 3,300 for the base tier and about 6,600 for the, the higher tier. And the primary difference of those um, is in the Google product, the higher tier includes meeting recording. We could switch to Google Meet, get rid of go to meeting if we wanted to, uh, but you know, recording is a pretty important um, 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 element of that, or we could go for that lower tier and stick to go to meeting, which I'm guessing is a lot cheaper than, than that price difference. The primary difference on the Microsoft side is whether you get access to the desktop apps or you have to use their web apps. And that does seem like a pretty important difference in the Microsoft ecosystem, in my humble opinion. Mine do. Siobhan? Um, 
does the Microsoft one come with Teams? It does. Yeah, so I'm leaning towards the Microsoft one just because the desktop apps yeah. and Teams, because we can record in Teams, can't we? Would that would there be a limitation on that? I all, all I know is my experience with it with the state has been fine, but the state's got all of these things. So, you know, I can't say that we have the same level. Anyway, I'm done. Uh, let's see, Ray, Jeremy, Henry. Uh, Chuck, I didn't hear specifically that you made a recommendation. Could you articulate what that is? And then I'd like to uh, get the floor back. <laughs> Uh, I have not, I, I have intentionally avoided making a recommendation so as to not bias the conversation. And I want you to bias the conversation. I want to be informed from some of the best people who know what the hell is going on. And so I want to know what your recommendation is. I mean, <laughs> yes. uh, I, I happen to be quite fond of the Google suite of services. Um, I use it a lot in my work on a day-to-day -day basis. I find it to be quite adept at what it does. And if I never had to fire up the desktop applications, I would be quite happy. Um, that said, the downside there is that I, I work in the startup world where of not open meeting law covered collaboration. And so the, there is a real benefit to having the desktop apps um, and not having to say compose a document on Google Docs, download it using their export feature, and then email it around. Uh, being able to just have your document right there and, and email it around pretty quickly, um, there, there is some definite benefit in that. But uh, I would probably lean towards the Google suite if this were solely my decision. Okay, so as, as a lawyer, I'm used to having my advice ignored, and so I'm going to ignore yours. Um, the second part was, <laughs> the second part was, it, money is no object here, right? I mean, we're going to give back what we don't spend. And so the idea that we wouldn't have an, an email address for alternates, where we would really like to know, you know, who were the delegate and who was the alternate when we're having a conversation. So I, I think that's, you know, penny wise and pound foolish. So I'd, I'd go with at least something that's going to get us to that, to that tier, okay? Uh, and anything that's going to help us communicate and collaborate better. Um, I'm all in favor of. So, so just a, as a point of information, money is an object here because mm. we can we can only pay for one month of this, and then we will have to absorb the cost of it for for perpetuity in order to to keep this stuff going. So we will. So if we are, it's thirty three hundred dollars a year, right? So that's roughly three hundred dollars that we can get this the CARES Act funds to cover. And then the rest, it's going to be another $3,300 next year. But if we're saying, this is what I'm trying to find out is of the $20,000 that we have from the community, from our community foundation, do we want to allocate $3,000 ish of it to do this? Or, or 6,600 if we want to go with the desktop apps. Right. Which, which I see, I mean, if we, if we need to give email accounts to alternates at CV fiber as well, um, then yeah, this is this is part of the, the conversation. I'm hoping to at least get some wind blowing one way or the other, because we kind of need to move on this. Jeremy, you're, you're next, so, then Henry, then Siobhan. So one question that I had with regards to getting certainly accounts for alternates, I have Microsoft myself, so I'm not sure that I would specifically need the desktop app because I already have the desktop app. You know, I wouldn't use that. I wonder if we can do something that's a little bit more targeted where we give out accounts to people that A, would use them because there are a lot of people that maybe show up to meetings but don't write a whole lot and don't have their own um, access to the desktop apps. Just a thought, I don't know. With either provider, we would have the possibility, I believe for no additional charge, to create alias email addresses that forward to your personal address or a Gmail address, you know, uh, or something like that. So we, we could certainly consider something like that. Yeah. Okay, so I have, uh, let's see, I have Henry, then Siobhan, then John, then David. So my question is on the Google hosting, are we talking about workplace is it the workplace suite that you're okay i just went to a seminar on that and so i am very familiar with all of the aspects of that 
Looks like it's quite powerful. Yeah, and that was a that was a prerequisite for getting a organizational license for uh, Google Voice, which is which is what started this conversation in the first place. And and it was for the public sector, the 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 seminar webinar I just went to. Very good. So that could be where where we land. Uh, let's see, Siobhan, John, and David. Siobhan? I'm not sure I understood what you two just said about public. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't either. Don't feel um, bad, Siobhan. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying I, I went to a webinar that was um, discussing the uh, Google Workplace, um, and it was particularly targeted to the public sector. With actually the whole conference, it's a it's happening right now. It's a two day conference. It's all for Google for the public sector. So if anyone's interested, okay. email me. Okay. So all right. So okay, I understand now. Um, just a couple of comments for me. There are a lot of people who object to Google. It just in general and aren't going to want to use it for that reason. Um, the other thing is I probably won't need the desktop apps. I would like the desktop apps, but if it would save us money, I could use my work computer for stuff if I had to. Um, I would want an email, but I haven't had an active alternate ever. I don't know what happened to the one that they appointed. <laughs> I mean, I suppose they could go up the hill. He just lives up the hill, but you know, then I'd have to go up there. So, you know, it. I, we so far we'd save money on that can we do it piecemeal i think jeremy was kind of asking that but can we do the desktop apps piecemeal as well to keep the price down but then do we have to make a decision if we're going to buy pay for a year we're gonna have to pay for x licenses could we add a license in the middle of the year at a pro rate or something um but okay yeah um... I, yeah, anyway, uh, a yeah. number of questions there, and I don't know the answer to all of them. Um, I can tell you your last questions. Yes, we we can prorate. You know, um, um, as we our our needs grow or shrink or what have you, they allow you to add and remove licenses, and 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 that's not a problem. Um, now, to your question around the desktop apps, if we were choose to, to do Google, no, because they don't have desktop apps, so that that would be off the table if we chose Google. If we went the Microsoft route. Um, there, I don't know whether you can have uh, email only account. It, they're, they're, it's kind of an a la carte uh, uh, package um, and whether you can have some users on the lower tier that don't include the desktop apps and some users on the higher tier that do, I, I would have to look into that and, and get back to the group. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Jeremy the last word, but we'll do John, David, and then Jeremy. Uh, again, we're just uh, trying to figure figure out a sense of whether this is something that we should go forward with. Um, we're going to survive through the end of the year, but I don't know that we'll be able to use the CARES Act funds effectively this year. So, uh, John? Uh, so, I echo Jeremy's thought that uh, there may be a lot of people who already have the desktop apps. I do. Um, I also have a preference for Google over Microsoft in general. So that uh, sort of counteracts Saban's uh, point. And I think that probably we have a lot of people in both directions in both camps. Um, I also wanted to, to know, would there, would there be an expectation that we use these email addresses? Uh, I have an email address that I use for everything and I would prefer to continue to use that for everything. I'm, I'd be happy to let this uh, an email a CV fiber email address forward to to mine, but then when I send something out, it's going to come from my address. It's not going to go back through through CV fiber. I think that's a reasonable question, um, and I th I think that that's a kind of policy discussion that we've not yet had. Uh, let's see, uh, David, and then Jeremy. I just want to say I own Microsoft Office 365. I pay for it every year. So, I mean, I don't know how many people have it. I am definitely a Microsoft person because I find working in Google Docs and Google Sheets sucks. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jeremy, you want uh, you want to deliver the punchline? Uh, yeah, I was just saying that forwarding to email addresses is maybe not the best thing because 
me you could set up a reply so that it replies from the you know from the cvfiber.net email address so it looks like it's just you know but that's maybe tricky to do for people that don't know exactly what they're doing um so I think that if we're going to give people email addresses, they should be actual email addresses. Anyway. Okay. Sounds good. So I, I think um, maybe what we'll do is uh, communications committee. If you, next time you guys have a meeting, if you want to just chew on that for a bit, you can get into the weeds. Can and you? in, and in that, uh, in the spirit of that, I would, I'm going to move to appoint uh, RD Eno to be a member of the communications committee. Second. Who okay. is the second? Seconded David Healy. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Trying to and uh, any any further discussion? Yeah. Any amendments by adding anybody? Any more voluntolds? Yeah. Does anybody else want to want to join the communications committee while we're while we're in this? All Please. right. So so oh. uh, on on that topic, uh, I have invited a guest. Um, Gabriel Gilman, you'll you'll see him here. Um, he is a Moortown resident and a state employee, uh, and um, an all-around kind of shady character that I would trust uh, uh, immensely. Um, Gabe, do you want to jump in and just kind of give a quick intro of yourself? Oh, hi, Chuck. Thank you, and my apologies for um, connecting a little bit late. Um, I'm Gabe Gilman. I am a neighbor of Chuck's in Moortown, um, and you know very interested in what you're doing and grateful to contribute in any way that I um, that I'm All right. So, um, and Gabe, you'd be willing to serve on the communications committee and, and work with Chuck? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And that's Excellent. Great. And, and John, I saw you had your hand up briefly. Are you also interested in serving in that capacity? I, I am interested in the committee. I'm not sure that I have the time in the next couple of months. Perfect, though. That's exactly okay. what we need. So I'm, I'm sure we will continue to need oh, really? folks uh, after the next couple of months as well. So, um, so, so just, just to be 100% transparent here, um, part of the reason we're looking for a ramp up of people on the communications committee is that so we can have breakout groups more effectively of members of the communications committee to work on this website project because right now three people is a quorum and it's very hard to do anything uh and so if we were to increase the size of this body to say uh seven or eight people and make four people a quorum we'd have more effective collaboration so john if you did want to go ahead and join this committee for a couple months time get a feel for it and then revisit in a couple months time as to whether your participation is, is going to work, that is okay. One dangerous caveat there is the communications committee is going to have to have a few meetings over the course of the next few weeks and we will need to reach quorum. Um, and so, you know, I just wanna make sure that anybody who does raise their hand right now, uh, while you may not have to do any of the work coming up in the course of the next three weeks uh, that you're at least willing to show up for a couple of meetings over the course of the next couple of weeks uh, so that we can have that quorum established and if we're above quorum you could probably even drop if 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 need be all right so uh, any thoughts john before we i take jeremy's comment uh the difficulty for me is that i am so busy that i often forget as you may have noticed to, that there's a meeting uh, if somebody would like to give me a call, I would be able to jump onto a meeting if you don't have quorum. Otherwise, I should probably not uh, probably not join. So, okay. so, so Chuck, he could be your on-call quorum maker. Um, well, at this point, between RD and Gabe, we are we would be at seven unless anybody is planning on stepping down and and hasn't told me. So that does. Uh, put our quorum at the four I was hoping for. So at this point, anybody else I think would be gravy. Okay. And and, and, so, and again, anybody who wants to be involved in the project is more than welcome to either join the committee or just reach out and, and get involved on an ad hoc basis. Uh, Jeremy. So I had stepped down earlier. I'm not sure if I'm counted in that or not, but I could rejoin. So I, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm counted in that or not, but count me in it, I guess is what I'm saying. 
assuming everyone's happy with me. Jeremy, I, I never really recognized your, your stepping down, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, I guess we'll ignore that then. Well, well. I was wondering if so, I kept getting emails. <laughs> all right, well, let's, let, let's keep going then. And I think, uh, David, if you're amenable, we'll friendly amendment back. We'll go back and, uh, and add uh, Gabe Gilman to the, uh, to the appointment yes. along with, with R.D. Eno. It's a friendly amendment approved, yes. All right, so any uh, further discussion about this? Wonderful. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed abstentions or roll call requests? Excellent. Passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Chuck, you've got some more bodies. Anything Thank else you. from communications that you would like to do at this point? That, uh, that wraps up what we have, other than the fact that we have a lot of work ahead of us. And so I'll be reaching out to some people individually. Uh, to pull in as as needed, um, so don't be surprised if you hear from me. But otherwise, we'll be we'll be kind of rolling up our sleeves and trying to get this done. So thank you, everyone. All right, thanks, Chuck. So uh, moving along, business development committee report, David. Got it. So the business development committee met last week, and I forwarded a res proposed resolution for tonight to adopt on. Um, Moving forward with, with putting out, developing and putting out an RFP for contractors to do the inventory, the design, engineering, make ready, um, construction, and operations of a CV fiber first build. Um, I have pasted into the chat room the the resolution, which I will read, and um, I'm making a motion that we do this, and then somebody can second after I read it. Just, Whereas just, just a second, David, I, I don't see it in the chat. You, you huh. may have sent it directly to somebody. If you could just make sure it's set to everyone. Oh, forgot to hit the send button, I guess. Is it there? You newbies, let me tell you. It's, it does it's, look like it got cut off. Yeah, I can, I can paste in the rest. Just, just go ahead and start reading it. I'll get the rest. Okay. Whereas CV Fiber was formed to deliver fast, reliable internet service to the unserved, underserved, and those with unreliable service within its 20 member communities, the project, and whereas CV Fiber has completed the feasibility study and business plan for the project, and whereas CV Fiber will be funding the project with state and federal grants and loans, customer subscriptions and individual loans and pre subscriptions, and whereas CV Fiber has retained the services of a project manager to oversee the implementation of the project. It is moved that CV Fiber approves the development of one or more RFPs by the Devel Business Development Committee together with the project manager. <laughs> one for poll data collection and a second for design and construction, a third for operation for each, for each for phase one of the project. That the RFPs are to be submitted to the board for review and approval at the board meeting on January 12th, 2021, but a target issuance on January 18th, 2021, and that the RFPs each provide for the possible award to one entity or group for phase one, or for awards to multiple entities to meet the requirements thereof, and that operations is to consist of actions typically performed by an internet service provider, such as network operations and maintenance, as well as customer operations, including but not limited to installation, system maintenance, and management, customer support, and billing. So that's the second. motion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Siobhan seconded it. Thank you very much. Um, discussion. Henry. Um, so I'm curious how this is going to interact with the NRTC work. Is that independent of this or is that somehow combined with this or how does that work well that's sort of why we're waiting till middle of january to do this we should have some settling of that out by then we doubt that we'll have anything settled with WEC by then but we will know what nrdc uh, the nrtc outcome will be by then okay so you don't know whether it's one way or the other whether it's separate or part of the scope of the work so the RFP will address all those issues and let the bidding entities understand some of the things they're going to have to be flexible with. Okay. Um, another question is, 
uh, you referenced the feasibility study. Has the uh, feasibility and business plan been updated for Duxbury? Do you got anyone? I would ask Tim whether he's had any communication with Interal on that. Uh, I did talk to Fred. It's uh, he's working on it in Duxbury and Waterbury, so we'll get that by the end of the year. Is was Washington. his expectation? Or excuse me, Washington. Okay. Um. All right, that's it. All right. Thanks, Henry. Michael. Oh, oh I'm sorry. There was one last question, which is, how um, uh, is this assuming that we get the startup funding? Um, for the visa loan then, or uh, or it's, how does that work with the finances in terms of us being able to fund that work in, in January? So putting out the RFP in January or early February probably doesn't mean we're gonna be selecting anybody till March 1st at the earliest, I think. Um, and we will have access to possibly, I mean, we can access the money from the state beginning on January 1st is what the current plan is. So we would have some money to start to not only match Vita's requirements, but also start on the um, the inventory and design work. Excellent, thank you. All right, Michael. Um, call everyone's attention to the dates that are in the um, motion. Uh, approval of board meeting on January 12th for target issuance on January 18th. Um, I support the motion, um, but I also want everyone to be aware, at least in my opinion, that that target may change. The target date of January 18th may change um, based on what we learn about what other entities are doing so that we can properly select the route. Um, one date I can give you now, as of yesterday, the FCC announced that the prohibited communications period will end on January 29th. Um, there will be more information coming out before that, but the full information won't be free to be talked about until the end of January. So it's possible that we may be looking at something at the beginning of February rather than the 18th. Yeah, and in the it says target. Is a target date. That's why the word targets there, and I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. And we and we okay. can amend it on the twelfth as as necessary. Okay. Uh, so Siobhan, then Ken. I was just going to point out the eighteenth is pretty much the date. It's not going to happen. That's that's the date we put in there for the day. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you have little faith. All right, uh, Ken. Yeah, and I don't see the necessary relationship between the embargo on information from Ardoff and releasing the RFP. They have still will have a significant period of time to respond to the RFP, and there will be additional information um, that, that's um, available after the release. So I, I do want people because I, I do want I do feel this one's going to um, benefit from some significant time for the responders to really learn a great deal and respond directly to it. So. I'm I'm enthusiastic about actually getting it out there, even with the recognition that um, some of the details won't be available for them to respond to until into the response period. Um, I have Ray, then Michael again. So, uh, Ken, um, it's, it's likely that there's going to be some sort of a footprint that uh, let's say we're talking about the blue route just as a general thing, okay? And that um, uh, there's likely that some of the RDOF stuff is gonna have some sort of um, a footprint within that those three communities, for example. And if that's the case, it'd be helpful to know that when we put, when we define phase one, we can actually define phase one uh, more clearly for purposes of bidding. Um, that, uh, and that's why phase one isn't defined. It was originally defined in the motion you, that you saw the first time around. And that was taken out because of that. Plus at the same time, we didn't want to raise the expectations of particular communities or incur the ire of other communities. Um, so that's why phase one was not defined here. 
and we'll do, but we will define phase one when we get when we get to the point where we have a, a, a motion to put before the board and for them to approve it for its actual release. All right, Michael. Uh, Ray pretty much said what I was going to say, Ken. Um, the only reason to wait is that we don't want to ask someone to bid on a route that is going to change. They, they need to know what they're bidding on. And so if the route is possibly going to change based on the information that comes out, it would be better to get it right the first time. Okay, anything else on David's motion? Everybody ready to vote? Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, or roll call requests? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Anything else, David? I'll let Tim take care of the canvassing stuff. Okay, under the project manager's report? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, let's do um, policy committee report. Alan, this is yours. So the policy committee, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. 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 Okay, good. Thanks. <clears throat> so the policy committee met last, uh, oh, no, last night. Uh, yeah, last, yeah, Monday. And yeah, <laughs> I don't even know what month it is, let alone the day of the week. Give me a break. Um, <clears throat> And what we're what we're trying to do is to respond to the proposal that had come before the board back in November uh, to make some changes to the conflict of interest policy so we could cover situations where there might be a conflict of interest that a contractor or a subcontractor uh, may have. So what we did last night was we looked at a proposal that I sent out to all of you about two and a half hours ago. And I've just sent out the, on the chat function, the um, sort of the meat of the, of, of what the changes would be. What we're suggesting is that we do make uh, some changes in the form of an addition, a new additional F portion to the board, uh, governance board conflict of interest policy. But that in addition to those three items in the new section F, we add language to every conflict, uh, to, to, every con to every RFP and to every contract going forward that speaks to the responsibility of the contractor to, in an RFP, tell us who the contractor is planning to have as a subcontractor, should they get the con contract? And then if the contractor bidding adds another subcontractor that wasn't on their initial list, they have to get approval from the CV Fiber Governing Board, or I wrote it, the board or the executive committee, and we can, we can talk about that later. They would have to get approval from one of those entities before the subcontractor was approved to become part of the work. The language that is what I call attendant to the policy, the language about RFPs and the language about the contract itself is actually from state uh, contracts. David Healy was nice enough to dig up a state contract for me <clears throat> and, I, and he found that indeed the state is already covering what I think we have been having some difficulty figuring out how we could deal with. Um, and I came to the conclusion and the board last night, I think agreed that really this is, this is more of a contract issue than it is a policy issue. We still think it's fine if we put some language in our conflict of interest policy, but the real defining language that's going to allow the uh, identification of subcontractors is going to be in the language that goes either into the RFP or goes into the contract. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions about what's going on and how this is going to work. 
I have, a, I have a, a minor correction in your updated language under section F, F3. There was a copy and paste that just mentions central Vermont internet. So if that could just be made CV fiber, that's, I, that's trivial, but just yeah. pointed out. Yeah, I noticed that the other day when I was going through. I, just for a point of clarification, Jerry, Jeremy, are we still officially in the Secretary of State's office, um, Central Vermont Internet, or or has yeah. that changed? We are. I, I haven't. I we authorized in our last meeting. We authorized um, me to go and make that change. I I haven't done it yet. I'm going to do that when I finish my grading uh, this weekend, next week. Yeah. Or was that me that was supposed to do that, Jeremy? That was you? I thought so, seeing as I've got the account with the Secretary of State. Well, go go and do that then. Um, I, I haven't gotten to it either. I've got, you know, finals and all no, sorts of other stuff going wait, on. Wait, uh, wait until after finals. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really not convinced that there's a, a pressing need for that particular bit of administrivia right now. Well, I'm certainly okay. glad I included Central Vermont Internet in this document so we've had this discussion. You guys Thank can... you, Alan. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other any other questions about these changes? Is everybody happy with these? Tom? Uh, I'm just considering how contracting and RFP work will happen down the road. I'm wondering, should we have some sort of formalized like stage gate of, you know, a, a committee forms a, a form and maybe it goes through the policy committee for review or anything like that, um, just to make sure we're not making governance rules just so we can completely ignore them down the line. So if I understand correctly, the question is, should we have some mechanism for reviewing contracts and RFPs before they go out? Boy, that's a question probably not for the policy committee, but for Jeremy or somebody else on the executive who, who thinks like an executive at this point. I mean, we, we, could, we could find ourselves in the roles of being full-time employees if we're not careful here uh, without pay. Um, well, some of us are already the ones who were laughing, I think. Uh, <laughs> we're all I mean, Ray, David. <laughs> Ray, Ray, you sort of, you sort of talked a bit about contracts last night when we were meeting, and it, it, it seemed to me from the way you were talking, we ought to be able to come up with standard language, sort of what the state has done, and just make sure that that's in all of our contracts and all of our RFPs. Yeah. And, and then beyond look. that. For this issue, I, I mean, for stuff beyond this issue, I don't know how you guard against other things happening. No, we, we can definitely do that. And, and you might have noticed in the last motion, we actually approved that um, uh, the board is gonna review uh, the RFPs to be issued for the polls, as well as the uh, operations and design construction, for example. So um, they're actually, you're actually gonna see that, uh, and you'll see, the, you'll see contract language in there concerning conflict of interest. But Ray, there's no there's no reason that we should require that kind of review for every contract, right? We don't want to get into that. We we want to save it for the ones that really are of substance and 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 there's an important issue at stake. Well, there's there's some people that ought to ought to, ought to see that it, it's it's um it's it's really kind of technical stuff. I mean, it's boiler a lot of boilerplate stuff, but um, the stuff that the board should be really interested. in is in the recommendation from the various committees concerning the statement of work. I mean, that's that's the de that's the details, right? Uh, the rest mm -hmm. of it has to do with um, the ob the legal obligation between the parties and things like uh, what's the format of the response. So they were all they're all saying the same thing in the same paragraphs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and it meant, so I would expect that if the board saw an RFP, they would kind of focus in on particular items, and the rest of the stuff. Y'all won't care that much about. Same so we should board. really, so we should really be thinking in terms of almost two different parts of a contract: the boilerplate stuff that really is boilerplate stays there, doesn't change unless there's yep. a reason. Yep. And part B, which is the particulars of that contract. Absolutely, the statement of work. Yep. All right, uh, David, and then RD. Yeah, I was just going to say that the language that I gave Alan came from attachment C of the state contracting language, and it's always an attachment to every every contract, and it's in every RFP that the state issues, so that the the bidder knows what the state's boilerplate is, and and it, you pay attention to it because they do pay attention to it. Right. RT. 
Um, what constitutes a conflict of interest and who on the board is responsible for identifying a possible conflict of interest? Well, th that is a great question that many minds in the legislature have been, have been uh, a lot of thought into. We tried to, in the conflict of interest, uh, conflict of interest policy, to, uh, to answer those questions as best we could. Basically, our conflict of interest policy is one that was drafted by uh, Jim Barlow, who used to be on the board. He's an attorney. He used to work for Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I think he used the League of Cities and Towns uh, model policy as a model for ours. So it, it, it tries to define conflict as well as anybody in the state has been able to do it. But I've, I've got to tell you, R.D., the whole issue of what exactly constitutes a conflict of interest is often in in the eye of the beholder and um it's it's um this has been this has been a difficult issue for everybody in state government and in frankly in, in all municipalities and boards public boards across the state and i think we're all working on this identifying conflicts of interest and, and doing something about it but it's not a hard and fast science that can be applied to this at this point. So, uh, so our RD, I would point you to Al Alan's email to the board uh, at 435 this afternoon, which has the entirety of the policy, which has a specific definition of what we call um, prohibited conduct. And that's going to be, that's going to hopefully clarify it. So I have uh, Tom, then Ken. Yeah, um, so uh, first, this is a side thought I was uh, brought up with Alan earlier today of um, we don't really have a location where all the policies that we've created are housed, so one can go easily look up what our um, governing body policies are. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be something we want to work towards, whether it's on Google Drive or whatever. Um, another thought, um, so I, mean, I was basically looking to see, like, if we have a checklist, right? if, if we already talked about other contracts going out the door today for doing web pages and so forth. Just that I'm not, I'm not looking to slow things up, but that before someone pushes the send button, there's a five point checklist that says, hey, did this get included? Did this get included? Did this get included? And there it goes. Um, and whether it's boilerplate that gets thrown in there, that's fine. Um, but just to make sure that, I mean, if I was sending that out, I would want to have some mechanism to be able to ensure that I'm not putting myself in hot water by going against the board's wishes. I think that seems reasonable. I, I, I don't think we have that, that checklist just yet, but it would be nice. Uh, Ken? Yeah, so, so right, the text that we're looking at here, um, to, to me, does raise the question of, is this in the context of conflict of interest, or is it, or is it the more broader um, topic of malfeasance, um, other behaviors, that would be the basis for us to not have someone work on a project. So I just, you know, I work for the state and I do, um, when, when that clause in attachment C comes before us, we have a checklist of items um, that we go through and actually conflict of interest is not one of them um, that, I, that I'm aware of, it, maybe, but it's not one of them. So um, again, as we pass this, I think we need to be very clear that if this is our means of addressing conflict of interest, we, we should be really clear about that um, because it say oftentimes it, it, it puts a burden on us as board members to recognize a conflict of someone when, when there are these other topics of malfeasance and poor behaviors that I think is what we're also very interested in making sure subcontractors are, are addressing or that are meeting standards. So, so if, if, Ken, if I, if, if, oh, go ahead, Alan. Okay, so, so Ken, this did come up uh, to some extent at our meeting last night. And I think one of the problems we have as a board is we don't have any, any administrative arm. I mean, we have Tim working for us right now, but we don't have the resources of the state or the legislature or even a company that might be able to do investigations or might be able to make inquiries on a, on a significant basis. Uh, and, and I think generally that's what makes w defining and identifying and dealing with conflicts of interest really, really difficult for a lot of public entities. 
we're not greatly resourced in essentially being being people who can police things that um, maybe haven't haven't been done correctly by somebody or they got out of line. And so we have to come up with the systems that we think are going to work the best, be most effective, and will catch as much of the stuff as we possibly can. And I I think I think following the state language is is the best option for us right now because we know the language has been vetted, it's been around. But we have to remember this is going to be only one small part of a contract. And we can put all sorts of other protections and backstops in a contract that we want to. But in terms of how could you do better with a policy on policing conflict of interest, I think that's about as far as, as we've been able to figure out how to go. Yeah, and my, you know, my perspective looking at this from a, uh, as a, as a former select board member, you know, municipal officers kind of have to deal with this also as in a lot of cases, in many cases, as unpaid volunteers as well. And they have to navigate the same conflict of interest. And as a, you know, a, like a three person select board in Elmore, you know, they have to do this, you know, Montpelier city councilors have to do this, you know, Montpelier city councilors have staff though to manage that. But the select board members in small towns and in large towns still have to look at malfeasance they still have to look at conflicts of interest and yeah and there's a bit of um flying by the seat of our pants i think is um you know maybe a glib way of, of putting putting what alan was saying out there so i mean if i i would say if, if there's other things that we should be doing i mean i i think we can certainly add to this but are, is there something in here ken that you think we ought to be taking out or you or doing differently I think it's the context of the language um, that, again, with the, this has been raised in the terms of conflict of interest, and um, it it, uh, it it's more it's this is way more than that, and I think it's appropriate. We need to have a mechanism to assure that we have some ability to review subcontractors, absolutely. But again, I I'm. I, I'm not sure that it hits conflict of interest very, very squarely. Um, I see. If this policy was renamed so that it was a bit uh, broader in title, would that be sensible? Yes. yes. Okay. Would you, so do you have a name ahead. in mind? <laughs> um, what, what's the current name? Policy on conflicts of interest. Paragraph F is added to what? I'm sorry. Paragraph F is added to what? The the governing board's policy on conflict of interest. Okay. I mean, we could call it conflict of interest and ethics, or ethics and conflict of interest. Yeah. I do not have a suggestion at this point. So if maybe for right now, um, if we could just keep the amendments as they are, and then as we look to broaden this, or if somebody comes up with a reasonable title for this, I think that's that, that's a pretty easy change. I mean, I would be perfectly happy if we had you know a good turn of phrase right now to, to do this. Let, let's do that. Otherwise, I think we can approve this and then give it a better name down the road. Uh, RD, I saw you. Pop your hand up for a second. Yeah, RD. Yes, um, uh, I I would recommend that if, if there's boilerplate from the state defining conflict of interest that we append it to our policy. And uh, Alan, I'm not sure whether I heard an answer to the question of who is to evaluate whether a, a, a contractor or a potential contractor has a conflict of interest. Uh, who, who, who on CB5 is responsible for making that assessment? Well, essentially, if the conflict of interest becomes apparent um, because of information that's given in response to an RFP, it's whoever is on the board, or maybe it's the full board, is doing the review of the proposal. 
and and and, and RD, this is this is section D of the policy. It clearly lays out how these conflicts of interest shall be disclosed and managed. I mean, there is. I'm, I I don't mean to cut you off, Alan, but this is pretty clearly okay. stated in the policy. Uh, it pertains to the governing board, not to contractors, though. Right. So yeah. So it's going to be us. And we're going to be expecting that they're going to be reporting conflicts of interest if they have them. That's a contractual obligation from them to us. If one of us discovers um, that there are conflicts in with a contractor or subcontractor, then it's going to be on us to inform the contractor that they're in violation of the contract. And then there's legal remedies to proceed from there. But it's 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 on us as the governing board. I mean, we're the we're the shepherds of this organization, and it's going to be us that are going to be the initial uh, folks that are going to be doing the not the enforcement, but calling the enforcement. Uh, Siobhan. you're muted. You're muted. I'm a dork. It is perforce relying on the the people responding to the RFPs to make themselves aware of the policy. They 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 would have to read the RFP. They would see the conflict of interest information. It, it's going to be there. And if I were going to enter into a contract with somebody and I saw language like that, I would think, okay, well, if I don't disclose conflicts of interest it could come back and haunt me because then I'm in violation of contract and I've got no recourse for collecting on the contract. It's, I, I, I can understand that there's only so much we could do. Like if we could see a name, like if we had, say we had a bad contract experience with this uh, contractor a year ago and then a con uh, RFP comes through and they're suggesting using that contractor as a sub and they have that in the list in the RFP, it's on us to remember, oh, that's the contractor that we had a really bad experience with and to have an enter into a dialogue with them and say, yeah, no, nah, not this one. Can you find somebody else or, or something like that? So th there's some give and take there, but we don't have a lot of resources to go like go to the investigate what's going on with everybody, but we do kind of know who's on the naughty list at this point and if though if those names appeared we have a chance to have a thought and a discussion about it i guess i've done all right uh maybe last word tom and i'd like to have a vote on this um i mean some of that is you know information to the board is one thing but i think the the bigger thing here is protecting the board that if some other company comes along and doesn't get an award contract but then notices a conflict of interest that they're not coming back and trying to sue for reparations or something. Um, I mean, that's the major point of a conflict of interest clause, right? Is to try to protect us from people who are thinking that, you know, a contract is being done in an improper manner. I suppose that's fair. Okay. Unless anybody really is uh, screaming to comment, let's, uh, let's take a vote. So we have an amendment to the uh, conflict of interest policy, and I will just ask um, uh, the policy committee once this is amendment amended just to change Central Vermont Internet to CV Fiber, and, and actually it, it occurs uh, a couple places earlier on in the policy as well. Okay. But um, all those in favor of the amendments as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 So what I, I missed this. Was there an actual motion to uh, to adopt? My my connection cut out for a sec there. Uh, Alan, uh, I, Alan, did you? Yeah, I think I think when I when I proposed it, I I I meant that to be a motion. I I, I didn't use the ah. word motion, I guess, or moved, but I proposed it. <laughs> we just say I'll move that we accept the proposal. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so did sorry. we have a second? I think Siobhan seconded it because that's what she would do. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Okay. okay. Thank, thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, any any opposed abstentions or requests for roll call? Okay. 
Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Anything else on policy committee, Alan? No, that's it. Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, moving on, uh, grant funding update and CARES funding options. Um, I'm sorry, project manager report. I, I skipped you, Tim. Nope. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about the KU systems. Uh, Dave and I have been working with them, and they are uh, setting up what they call zones, which will be our routes broken down into more uh, finite chunks, and we can start using the uh, software expect that they'll be done uh, with those changes this week and then uh, at some point we'll have a handoff from them uh, to integrate that within our uh, website which will just be a link out basically to them uh, canvassing um, david sent some metrics from last mile they're well underway and we'll send uh, weekly updates uh, last week they made over uh, 500 phone calls and had, I think it was 143 respondents fill out a survey and subsequently others would uh, follow up later. They're going to hit those that they didn't reach the first time as well as continue on the 2,700 plus uh, phone numbers that they have. They're also going to start a text campaign for those that they have mobile numbers um, with uh, information as far as encouraging people to fill out the surveys. They have uh, reported that they've had very good feedback and engagement with those that they are able to reach. So it sounds promising. And as we likely guess, there's uh, many who are eager to uh, find out what's happening and, and when it will reach them. And uh, their team is likely going to start their door-to-door uh, -door, uh, either later this week or next week of starting to hit uh, boots on the ground with that uh, operation as well as the as they will uh, continue on the phones. Uh, I did send the uh, trifold and the door hanger, which will be used for those canvassing operations, went to the printer today and pushing them to hopefully get those, uh, pick those up this Friday and deliver those to uh, last mile to uh, start um, with that operation. I think Chuck talked pretty much about the website, so I'll uh, reach out to uh, Code Writer and we'll set up a kickoff call tomorrow with with them, and then I'll also alert the others who were not awarded uh, that business. And I'll continue work on the Vita application. Uh, I did send around the uh, areas that they will look for us to address in that application process, as well as uh, helping David, who's begun the ISP uh, RFP. I'll uh, help him um, continue to, to work on that uh, for, for issuance following, uh, following completion there. I believe those are the tasks that I've been up to at this juncture. Any questions for Tim? Henry, then Alan. Um, yes, I'm just uh, wondering about um, kind of coordinating with the town delegates um, as they're doing the canvassing. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'd be happy to, uh, con you know, contribute to that if, if I knew they were working on Duxbury, for example, or whatever. I did send them all your contact information. Um, and so as they begin, um, they have been told to, to reach out and see if there's uh, how much engagement you would like. So they do have your information, uh, email information, and uh, I'll, I'll remind them to, to reach out prior to, to things happening. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, Alan, then David. So Tim, is it correct that to think that, that if somebody hasn't been contacted by the uh, by last mile by Wednesday of next week, uh, if they haven't been contacted over the phone, that they they should they should they should expect a visit to the door, and if they want to avoid somebody coming to their door, they should take the survey online because some some people have more or less asked me this question. So the. 
uh, they'll be continuing with the phone calls, um, you know, through the end of the year, really, because they'll keep trying to go back uh, for those they haven't reached. So that that work will continue through the end of the year, uh, but they will start some ground operations as well. I don't have a schedule of where those are starting, um, but um, you know, they'll be obviously targeting those that that they haven't reached uh, via the phones. But, but what, they what try number the, the preferred method is reaching out. Yeah, what some people in Worcester have mentioned to me is they really would rather not have people coming to their door. I mean, given the pandemic, and I, I think probably under pandemic regulations, at least through the 15th of December, it, there really shouldn't be contact with people in going by residence. And so I, I think it's fair to offer people the opportunity to take it online, which I appreciated getting that address, the web address where people can go. And I know where people who, are, who have contacted me have, have gone ahead and done that. But I, I, I just don't want to see us get in trouble for violating pandemic restriction rules because we have people knocking on doors and uh, and they probably really should be doing that. Okay. Well, so yeah, if you could take that back to last mile and see what they have to say about that, I think that's valuable. Um, I have uh, David, and then I'm adding myself to the list after David. Yeah, no, the, um, just so everybody knows, they don't have phone numbers for everybody. They have phone numbers for about 65% of the addresses that we gave them. So they need to find a way of reaching these people. And if people don't answer the door, there'll be a, door, there'll be a, a material left on the doorknob to uh, fill out the survey. Um, doing front porch forum is a great way of doing it. In fact, when I put out the message on front porch forum, I got a lot of people filling in the survey. So, and and when they do that, when they they look at that list before they make a call, because they're not calling somebody that filled out the survey. And that goes by address. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm up next, then Chuck. Um, so. My question for you, Tim, is about, again, about the canvassing, and this is maybe what, Chuck, what you were about to say is, we had talked about the, the tempo of their phone calls and whether 500 was actually a reasonable number, given the amount of time that they've spent on it. It's, that's still, that's to me, seems like a, for the number of people they have, that that seems to me, too, like a small number. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm running a political campaign, I can personally do 500 calls in a week, no big deal. Um, and I and I know I know Connor Casey and some of the other folks on that team have definitely personally made more calls than that in a given week themselves. Um, so I'm just uh, wondering if they can can justify why it's so slow. Um, so, I mean, if that's the raw number of calls, I, I'm going to agree with Chuck and echo what he said last week that 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 seems that seems pretty sluggish, frankly. Yeah, I can check on the, you know, the actual metrics of how many people are doing it and what their, you know, what their volume are in a given day to get some sense of uh, justification there, but would agree because they had talked about up to 12 people, but I don't think they have 12 people full time, clearly making phone calls at this juncture. Yep. Okay. Uh, Chuck. I'll so uh, my, my question is actually something quite different, but thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm actually changing the subject a little bit, but uh, on the cruise systems, um, I think we're going to need to have a call with them uh, a little bit around discovery on uh, website integration capabilities. Tim, can you drive setting that up so that I can be armed with providing um, our new code writer uh, vendor uh, all of the details of, of what the possibilities are and, and the exact capabilities and documentation on the integration touch points and so forth? Will do. It'll be probably likely with Jessica. I'll work with your schedule. Okay, thank you. I, you should have the link. Okay. Anything else for Tim? Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to grant funding update and CARES funding options. Um, do we have anything to talk about here that's not um, WEC or ARDOF? We have a separate item to talk about that. Or is this, uh, yeah, David? 
Well, I mean, if Congress changes, you know, decides they're going to act this week or next Monday, we could see an extension on the use of the money that we weren't able to spend. So, I mean, I'm I'm super pessimistic about it, but I mean, if you're feeling motivated, <laughs> call up uh, call up Peter Welch and see if he yeah. could hear from another few people he hasn't already heard from. But he's he's on board as far as I know. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, moving on, uh, discussion on uh, our relationship and moving forward with WEC and some of the public information that came out of RDOF this week. Um, who wants, so Michael or David, I mean, if you want to be careful about what, what you say, if you want to give us a summary about what we saw with the public release of information, I can talk about it briefly too, my first instinct. No, uh, all right, I, I, guess, I guess I'll start. Um, so I was looking, so the um, consortium to which we belong um, won a fairly large number of blocks. If you haven't already, um, if you haven't already read the, uh, the message that Michael sent out, which I will have to go back and look at. I, did I get it? Yes, I see it. Um, so there's the, uh, so the breakdown, you'll see that the lion's share of the blocks were, were given to, given to, were won by consolidated. And those are, that's consolidated fiber. So the company that's currently doing basically DSL in the state is now moving on in a big, big way to fiber. Um, so, um, related to this discussion, uh, Tom, it looked like you had commented that you had actually gotten a survey from Consolidated because you may be in the service area for them. I, I don't know if you had uh, any takeaways from what you saw in that. Um, it seemed to be mostly, a, are you happy with us? And if not, why kind of survey questions. Because um, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> On my end, I don't, I don't know if yours experience. I haven't looked at the files you shared, but um, on my end, they did ask a lot of questions around remote work and um, whether whether there are people working here, whether this was a business, yada, yada, yada. But I do have a business tier account with them, so maybe that's why. Yeah, I don't think I saw that. It was, um, it was mostly the how, how are things going question, and then um, probably more than half of the survey was uh, stats about you, your income level, and <laughs> how many kids you have and whatever uh, mine, mine had no demographics information so definitely a, quite a slightly different survey was that on paper no it was an email that came in that went to a website okay so so Mike, michael has a nice breakdown um in that email that he sent out about the amounts and which and which towns which cv fiber towns got um or had blocks won by which entities? So that's it's pretty nice. And 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 David, I'll let you uh, you were going to say something too, but you would also put together a nice a nice map, as I recall. Map is there. Together. You can see you can see where in our where our you know the the four vendors and where they're located. I mean, you know, who knows what it's going. to We haven't sorted out the implications yet. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Chuck and Siobhan. Okay, so I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say here or not. Um, so let me start with a couple of questions first. Um, can can I call out, you know, I, I guess you just mentioned consolidated, so I, I clearly can call out specific ISPs, yes? And can I call out specific regions they were awarded? You can well, see so it on the map. If it's, if it's on the map, if it's in the public information dump that came out yesterday, then you can talk about it. I mean, that's- if it is, the, is the link you shared of your map the public information? Yes, that, that's the public information. Okay, cool. All right, so my region was awarded Starlink. What the <laughs> hell does that mean? <laughs> Elon, that means, Musk, like, Elon Musk loves you. That means- I mean, I get that, but it's satellite, like. <laughs> that, that means no, nobody bid on that block that was offering fiber, or yeah. they, were, they were asking for such a large subsidy that somehow uh, Starlink came in at a better at a better score. I mean, that's that's 
I assume that's that's how the math works out. And I mean, Michael, feel free to correct me, but that's I mean, that's that's the way it would have to have worked out. You, you and Michael, you're muted. If you're looks like your lips are moving. There you go. Not the only dork. <laughs> I mean, you're not the only dork. Um, so let's take a hypothetical census block group in North Carolina. And there's a consortium and there's a incumbent telephone company and there's a cable company and there's Starlink and they're all interested in winning the support in that census block group. And the auction starts and it's um, starts at a certain level and it gets to the point where they finally have a clearing round where awards can be made. And um, if, if um, at that point there's a tie between two fiber providers that will go on to the next round. But if in that round there's um, no fiber provider and the cable provider decides to drop out and Starlink is still standing, then they can win it. And so what conceivably Starlink's strategy was, is to bid in every single block in the United States of America and gather whatever money they can get from whatever blocks nobody feels is worth bidding on because it's gonna to be too expensive to build there for the subsidy that's being offered. So that's how a block could end up in the hands of a lower tiered bidder. Now Starlink was given the right to bid at a fairly high level, just under um, fiber. So they could outbid some other technologies. So that also is, gives you some color as to how they could have ended up in certain towns. It's because the other bidders just withdrew that they could win. Is that helpful? That is, thank you. Siobhan? Um, so space exploration technologies of Starlink? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm just looking at the map. I lost orange. Where did orange go? Near playing field. <laughs> <laughs> South of playing field, east of Barry. <laughs> there it is, there it is. I found it. I found it. All right. So I'm looking at the light green that is consolidated. So the stuff on David's map that is light green is the area that consolidated has said we're gonna serve these people. Is yeah, that so am I reading that? Was, Pardon? That is that is the scent that is I'm not looking at the map. I don't know if there's only one, but there may be a few census blocks within a census block group of multiple census blocks that the FCC is asking people to companies to serve for a particular level of subsidy. Okay, 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 okay. I'm gonna stop you. I'm on Trickle Brook Road. <laughs> yeah. Reservoir Road doesn't have anything on it, but Bisson Road, the Cutler Corner Bisson Road Brook, Orange Brook Circle here has light green on it. And that's just a parcel of land over from mine. It's like, so they're gonna serve the people who, the, the four people who live on Bisson Road I'm exaggerating. I think there's 10 people that live on Bisson Road, but not the the eight of us who live on Tricklebrook Road and up Reservoir Road a little bit. Is that the idea that they only they're only obligated to serve these light green spaces? That's right. That's right. Okay. The subsidy is not for a whole town. It's for locations in a census block that are 100% not served. Okay. And so there's another census block that you live in that is partially served. Partially served. Okay. And so that's the, okay. 
All right, I understand it. Thank you. It wasn't in the auction. So, okay. So they're they're not obliged to serve you, but it's quite likely that if they're building nearby, that they will very likely be building more fiber than just to those ten houses or whatever. Because, I because... don't want them. <laughs> sure. Their service is awful. <laughs> Uh, all right, all right, all right. I understand. Thank you. All right, I see a Tom and Henry. Uh, what's the timeline on that? That they are obliged to serve within ten so years. years. Ten years. No. No. Six years. Six 50 years. years. The support lasts. The support is ten years of support. And they have to show progress within two years, right, Michael? Three years. Um, if if they show progress, they have to complete forty percent of the build in three years. If they complete twenty percent of the build in two years, they get a better um, deal with the FCC going forward. But the the minimum obligation is to do forty percent of what they won within three years. Uh, quick, quick question, David: Is is this map suitable to be shared um, yeah. with the public? Yep. Not sure. Let me put put it. In. I I just did. Oh, you did. Okay. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see. I, I Henry then Alan. Yeah, I just I just was going to comment that uh, a big reason why the data is so inaccurate from the FCC census blocks is because it's based on the 2010 census. So that that's going to change in the future when since 2020 is just about uh, complete. If we ever get the 2020 data, I'm on the apportionment board and we won't be able to meet our <laughs> statutory obligation to do the apportionment because we won't have the data in time. Okay. Unbelievable. It's actually um, based on E nine one one data. Not, not not in Duxbury. Well, it's it may not be accurate, but that it was based on state provided E nine one one data. I don't think so. All right. Well, we, why don't you guys take yeah. it offline? You can <laughs> fight, fight that one out. Uh, Alan, you're next. So I, I want to make sure I understand these maps. It seems to me that some of the most important information you want is not on the maps. All those areas where nobody is going to be doing any work, it doesn't necessarily mean that nobody wanted to bid on those areas. It simply, it could mean that, or it could mean that they were never identified as a census block to be served. Is that right? Can, can I keep answering questions? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, every census block group in Vermont was awarded. None of them were not awarded. Everyone was bid upon okay. and okay. were all awarded. But many, many census block groups in Vermont were not in the auction. The reason they weren't in the auction is because at least one location taints it such that it can't be considered 100% unserved. And that's based on some faulty data, as Henry's pointing out, based on um, provider self-reporting of what they what, what levels of service they deliver. It's based on a lot of things. So it's, it's, it's not ideal, but it, that was the ground rules. So, all the census block groups that were eligible were awarded and the map accurately shows who they were awarded to. In the case of consortia, you can't know which consortium member um, was awarded which group and that will come out later. So, so I was looking at this map trying to figure out of what strategic value is this to us in terms of trying to figure out where we want to start working first or second or third or whatever? Because if you look at the map generally, it kind of looks like you have a 
you have little bits of cancer that are starting to grow in different parts of the area. I mean, it's metastasized in some places to larger areas, but otherwise through, you know, the through the CD fiber area, it's all, it's, it's kind of over, it's somewhere in most of the ones, but not huge chunks of it for the most part. So it's almost as though somebody was setting up a system for blocking somebody who wanted to build a line through a town because maybe a third of the town now is going to get served by somebody else. And so therefore the other people, the other two thirds on the other side of that block have just had the chance of their being served by an incumbent um, uh, diminished and by being served by somebody like us that's probably diminished as well because we can't pick up those customers in the first third of the mile or 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 first of first mile of three miles. Am I am I missing something here? I it does not seem like a positive thing to look at for people like us who are trying to build a area wide system. We could say uh, we would have we could have the opportunity to build out first before they did. Because we now know where they're going to build? Well, we know where they're going to build, and we know where we were planning on building. I don't know. We There's some little debate to go on on this one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it seems like an arms race to me. It, 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 seems like, <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like fuel has been put on the fire of an arms race. And that's why I think this is also, when we start talking about WEC, we're going to have overlap between this discussion and that discussion because i think WEC is going to possibly make possible david what you just said maybe we are now now we know where to start building i mean it's maybe that's what it is all right so if i if we could do a tom then michael then david i have to step aside for a bit because i'm getting to the uh to to bedtime so i'll be right back and you can you guys can take in that order tom david or time michael and david well i mean it seems like both for us and and for consolidated and everybody else um maybe not spacex if we have to build 40 percent out within three years then that's going to very heavily lean on where you're going to build if you can and that, does it go by number of residences or land area i mean what's it going by so that i mean consolidated is probably going to go by major metropolitan area to try to build out as much as they can within that number first so they make sure to ensure their funding is that accurate <laughs> Michael uh, David's answer. laughing. He can answer this best, I'm sure. Michael, I think you're right, Tom. Uh, so, Tom, you're you're onto something. Um, this is where we're getting into the area where we're not allowed to speak. Um, we can't speak about strategy. We can't speak about the bidding process that took place. Um, we can't speak about plans. So I can speak generally to your question, and that is, um, it would behoove any company, first of all, the answer is it's about the number of locations, it's not geography. So uh, you're correct, it would behoove any company that's one to gather as many locations early as possible, and that would be favor much more populated areas than sparse areas. So that is a clue as to what a company might do and how someone else might respond. Um, maybe I should leave it at that. Oh, can I make one more comment? Um, of course. To Alan. Alan's very important question, which is that we've got this cancer of all these dots and how does it make any sense? Think of it in an entirely different way. Don't think of it as some company trying to connect all those little tiny dots. It's more about getting a certain level of subsidy. It's about the dollars. So you, <laughs> companies would bid in order to amass a certain amount of money so that it could subsidize a build and that build would certainly include areas that are not directly obligated to be served it would 
be a build that serves much larger areas that make sense rather than that cancer. And I guess there, that's all I'll say about that for now. So follow right, the uh, money. Well, it's it, it's it's going to make whoever's overall build cheaper. It's not necessarily that they're only going to build in those places, but that as they go and build a bigger project, and Consolidated had announced two months ago that they had just gone after a whole bunch of new capital. So as they look at, at a build, and they can then say, as long as we cover these addresses in our build, we can subtract whatever, however many million dollars from that build. And then they sort of amortize that out over... Um, mm -hmm. the entire project, mm -hmm. as long as they can finish that project in the FCC amount of time. I, I, is that a reasonable way of rephrasing it, Michael? Yeah, and and unfortunately, we'll have to wait until January 29th to talk about those kinds of implications. Um, there's a lot of information that we have access to that will help explain that, but that's absolutely prohibited. We can't talk about that stuff now. All right, uh, David, then Jeremy. I'm passing. Okay, Jeremy. I mean, I, I guess just to speak to Alan's point, I still think that even if they are gonna do a build, bigger build than just a dot here and a dot here, that it's likely they are going to not build out to the fringes. Yeah, that's been my experience in Worcester. It's most of the roads, I mean, the majority of, of, of back roads, dirt roads in this town end in a dead end. You know, they, they come up against typically pub, public forest land and there are no more houses. So the, so, so the lines just end. Um, and it's, I think that's a problem in other towns as well. All right, Tom, and then um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about WEC if we can. Just one more uh, clarifying question for the experts in the room. Um, so, so is that 40% related just to the Vermont section? So if one of these companies has won something in a different state, they'd have to get 40% in that state. It doesn't consolidate together or something. Good question. Um, it is, it, it's state by state. So if, if a national company wins in 12, 12 states or 20 states, in each state, they have to hit their 40% level. Thank you. And um, and I just want to call your attention to if if you're looking at the thing I sent out, um, in the state consolidated got roughly double what the NRTC consortium got, but in CD fiber it was almost the same amount. So that's that's really significant. All right, so um, WEC, any updates on, on WEC? I assume you all saw the um, their um, monthly newsletter that Alan sent out. I thought that was that was pretty cool. Anything else that, uh, David, that we need to know about? Well, what I have to, I have to say, you know, Barry Bernstein from the board checks in with us regularly and me with him. And I would say as much as I'm sort of frustrated at the pace they're moving at, they're moving forward positively, and they are. Uh, the biggest concern right now is is the financing. They can get the loan, but they have to pay back the loan. And if they have to pay property taxes on thirty million dollars of investment, they would have to increase their electric rates by five to ten percent in the first couple of years, which they're not sure the PUC would approve of that rate increase to run fiber. So they are pretty aggressively trying, you know, lobbying the legislature to exempt uh, municipally based fiber to be exempt from um, the property tax. Now this is probably going to get somewhat confident, uh, co um, uh, it's it's not going to go over well with some places, but the, the towns that currently get this property tax, so the state education fund that gets this property tax. Frankly, it's not getting it now. So this is sort of a new source of revenue and property tax. Um, but if it does mean increasing the cost of fiber to the premise or broadband to unserved areas, it's like 
state is hurting itself by doing one policy and not another. So we are supporting at this point, we may have to have a board resolution supporting this um, uh, request by WEC to the legislature. Um, and you're, you know, getting in touch with your own representative on this. So that's one of the things that WEC's doing there. There, um, well, I don't know if I mentioned this at the last meeting, when we were looking at the uh, Moortown um, CUD COVID grant project, their operations guy went out and inspected all 64 poles on that route in one day. And he's incredibly excited about this potential for running fiber in their territory. And he wants to see that it happens. So I'm, I'm, it's just gonna take a while. <clears throat> Michael, do you have anything else you wanna say about WEC? No, I think you said it well. WEC, I think WEC is gonna come through. Yeah. It's just gonna be slow. All right, any other, any questions, uh, Alan? I, I just want to say, maybe in conclusion, I was totally blown away when I read that piece in WEC because the energy that that Barry Bernstein was was portraying is just 180 degrees from where he was even just two or three years ago. I mean, I, I remember talking with him about this, getting involved in telecommunications five years ago at a public meeting, I think, a WEC public meeting. And they really did not want to hear about getting involved in any kind of internet connectivity project. So to see the turnaround in a relatively short time in the total scope of things and the depth of commitment they seem to be willing to throw at this, I was impressed and I, I felt it was like a, a door that was opening up for us. Yeah, very, very motivating. I, I, I read it too, it was very motivating. It kind of makes me sad that I'm not a WEC not a WEC member anymore. Uh, all right, anything else on, yeah, Jeremy. I was just wondering if, I, I seem to have missed that. Would you be able to send that, Alan, or put piece that in the chat? Uh, no, that was that was emailed out a couple, like a week or so ago. Yeah, it was a PDF. Jeremy, if you, okay. can't find it, if you can't find it in your email, just send me an email and I'll send it over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Alan, appreciate it. Sorry sure. about it. All right, um, moving along then. Um, so we have our uh, esteemed project managers contract coming up at the end of this year. And the previous funding source that we had used to pay Tim um, disappearing. And so we need to make some decisions about how we would like to proceed starting January 1st. Um, so what I would like to do is go into an executive session to discuss uh, Tim and Tim's work as a, um, you know, as a prelude to talking about how we move forward in January. And just so that I, um, just so that I'm clear, uh, Tim, you, you would be willing to stick around in the new year should we have funding to keep you on. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Um, actually, I, I, um, no, so no. I'd rather okay. say that, <laughs> say that I'd like my, uh, my service to end, um, I think, and just, I'm going to pursue other, other avenues and opportunities, um, for my, for my career with my ambitions and, and also candidly looking for, for benefits and such with, uh, with, uh, for my family. So. Okay. Fair enough. So that um, that simplifies the discussion somewhat. Um, on on the other hand, I would still like to bef before we uh, before we let you go, I would like to um, you know be able to uh, give you sort of a as as they would say in the in in the army a after action report. And if we're going to write you know write you a letter of recommendation or such, we we should know what what to put into it. But I would like to hear from the board to do that. So. Um, and then should any decision, you know, decisions or how we'd like to proceed come out of that executive session, I have a separately warned agenda item. We are well past our time, um, but I think, th thanks, thanks, Ardoff. Um, but um, I would like to then hopefully have a brief time when we toss out any motions that we might have um, 
after the executive session and then do a quick round table and adjourn or skip round table, whatever. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, I would like to, um, let me copy and paste this. Um, so, oops, yeah, I missed it, hold on. Try this again, copy. Just gonna post the my citation. So uh, I move that pursuant to one VSA section 313A3, we go into executive session to discuss uh, the evaluation of our project manager, uh, Tim Shea, as a um, personnel matter. Second. Okay, seconded by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Opposed or abstentions? Okay, we are in executive session and hi, Phil. I guess that means I need to leave then. That is correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I guess I'll, assuming that I'm, I'm appointed, I'll see you all uh, the next meeting. All right. And you have, yeah, I, have a good one. Yeah, be well. You still want to join? Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. And, uh, and 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 Tim, we would ask you uh, politely also to uh, have a good rest of your night, and we will yes. communicate. Uh, well, we'll communicate anything, any of our motions or whatever from uh, you know on tomorrow, I guess. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Okay. I will. I will actually be right back. So if if everybody wants to take like a two minute two minute pause, I'm going to mm -hmm. stop the recording. What about the worker? Uh, I will I will boot them as soon as I stop stop the recording. Uh, if I can, here we go.